very quickly coming back down and traveling for the most part over the Rockies, but actually fanning out. So, you know, when you think about those migratory routes, they aren't quite as lined as they look on the map, but it is a little superhero bird and there's my bird. <laughs> <laughs> and it is is such an incredible bird for so many reasons. And I don't know if you read much about Rufus Hummingbird, but I enjoy finding it in the literature because it gets such uh, such interesting adjectives uh, used for it. For one thing, it's the longest it does the longest migration by body size. And, and this bird is traveling over three thousand miles. So it's making quite an incredible journey for such a tiny little little bird. But I've read, all these words attributed to the Rufus hummingbird has been called aggressive, pugnacious, tough, tiny. I don't know about the one that's junky. Um, I can't remember where that came from, but a fighter, an extremist, um, tough and tiny, fierce, defensive. Um, so it gets a lot of little, I don't know, there's aren't totally positive adjectives for it, you know. Um, so I think that, you know, if you're writing about the Rufus hummingbird, you should think about all the amazing things it does, like its long distance migration and the fact that it's really working hard to survive. And I'm going to get into a little bit about Rufus hummingbird populations. The other thing about the Rufus hummingbird, though, is, you know, where you find it. And if you go to um, your map and your field guide or, you know, where the range of this bird is, you'll 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 find a more limited map in a lot of the guides. So you'll see that it it's overwintering in, in Mexico, and then it's uh, migrating through the United States and Mexico, and then uh, breeding in northern, the northwestern United States and, and Alaska, um, Canada. So spending its, its summer months, as, and it's already on its way. So they've already been sighted. I guess the sightings in Oregon, for example, are usually March 4th. So they sure did. They arrived back in Oregon at one of our partner biologist site on March 4th. So they're very, they're very timely too. So we can give it that. But then if you go to eBird and look where this bird is, this is where it really is. And what a lot of people don't know is that it has expanded its range quite a bit. We don't actually know a whole lot about it, but a number of years ago, um, I'm from Alabama and there was a really well-known Bob Sargent bander. Uh, he banded hummingbirds. He was a former electrician turned avid hummingbird bander. How that happened, I don't know. But he lived not far from my mother, so I used to go to his house and um, band hummingbirds with him. And um, they were starting to ban some of the first Rufus hummingbirds down there. Um, Fred Bassett is one of the banders there too and now comes into Colorado and other parts of the west to band hummingbirds in the summer. Uh, but now there's no, a known and established winter population of Rufus hummingbirds. And you can see that they can also uh, be found along coastal areas. And, and, you know, every year we get reports from New Jersey and other parts to the northeast uh, where this tiny little bird has gone. So one year, there's actually one recapture of a hummingbird with a band on it. That bird traveled between Alaska and Alabama. So all the way across the United States from the farthest corners it could go. Now, why, we don't know. Uh, but again, when you think about the, the expanded range of this little bird, it's pretty amazing. Um, so it definitely has wanderlust. So let's give it a new adjective there. But the, the challenge for Rufus hummingbird, and unfortunately, like many species, it, it is in steep decline. So it's one of these birds that a lot of biologists say, you know, it could disappear before our eyes and we might not know why, um, which is why we take this project, um, which is called the Western Hummingbird Project, very seriously. And the Western Hummingbird Partnership is a project that brings together biologists from Canada, the United States, and Mexico to try to identify gaps in our knowledge about Rufus Hummingbird and, and what's happening to it. Um, you know how hard these little birds are. Uh, but this species has decreased by 50% since the 1970s. It's considered near threatened by BirdLife International. It's on Partners in Flight's yellow watch list. It's a bird of conservation concern. It's up for listing in Canada. And then I don't know if you've heard the term tipping point species, but it's considered a tipping point species by a new initiative called Road to Recovery. That means that it's lost 50% of its population since 1970, and it's anticipated it could lose another 50% by 2050. 
So this is definitely a bird that we are working hard to keep our eyes on and try to figure out some ways to protect it as it makes that very long journey. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, but the point I want to make about, you know, losing 3 billion birds is, is that there are a lot of groups of birds that really aren't recognized in this. And one of those is the hummingbirds. Um, and the reason why, again, is because of difficulties in studying them. So most hummingbirds don't make many noises. They don't sing. If you go out on a breeding bird survey, you're not likely to capture them, uh, although you can, but, you know, the, you, they could be sitting in a tree quite close and you could even miss them. Um, so they're not captured in your traditional bird surveys. Uh, they're not captured in, in other programs like bird banding because not many people can band them. It requires a very special banding permit to do that. So there aren't that many hummingbird banders. So our information has a lot of gaps in terms of where are hummingbirds going. And then they're too small, right, for tags and, and telemetry and, and other forms of tracking them. Uh, so it's been difficult to fill in the gaps of why these birds are declining and what are some of the key locations where they even are, unless you happen to have a good setup of bird feeders. Um, this is one of the most recent um, research projects that does show what's going on with some of the hummingbirds across the United States, including the ruby-throated hummingbird. Now, the Western Hummingbird Partnership, obviously, we're focusing on the Western species, but this one includes ruby-throated hummingbird as well. So what you can see is that all of these lines are two kinds. One has dark black borders on it and the other type of um, uh, little, you know, line or, or, or graph uh, has a pale gray um, on it. So I don't have a pointer, do I? So for example, if you start at the far left, you can see that the far left is black chinned hummingbird. And the first blue point is 1970 to 2019. And then the yellow to the right is what's happening to the population from 2009 to 2019. And so what you see very clearly is that most hummingbirds are in decline. And as it gets redder and redder, that means a more severe and extreme decline. So even ruby-throated hummingbird has been showing some slight declines in recent years, something that nobody expected until uh, this research paper came out. Anna's, which is a Western species, is one of the only species that has been increasing and increasing quite dramatically, although that's decreased, its increase has decreased uh, in more recent years. But this is a species that has expanded its range north um, up in, even into Alaska, uh, where it didn't used to be found. So it's doing quite well, or at least relatively to the others. But then when you get into what are called the Salasphorus hummingbirds, which is the genus of this group of hummingbirds, you see that Allen's rufous broad-tailed and calliope are not doing so well. Um, so big declines there. All right, so this is what's important to Environment for the Americas and our partners, which is how are we working across borders and how do we consider birds um, in the different countries? So what we do is we work with some of the federal agencies and biologists and researchers in Mexico, again, uh, with Environment and Climate Change Canada, um, as well as with the US Forest Service International Programs in the United States and other partners from US Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Land Management, and you know the agencies that are managing federal lands. More recently, we started working with the Department of Defense, mostly to work on migratory monarchs, but we're also taking that opportunity to slip in uh, birds, of course. So what do we find from other countries? One is that um, Canada is considering, for example, Rufus as a species um, that could be listed. Um, it's listed as the, by the IUCN as near threatened. Um, Broad-tailed hummingbird uh, is not present in Canada. So when you look across this, uh, it is found in the United States and is a bird, bird of conservation concern. So the only species that aren't birds of conservation concern in the United States are Anna's and black-chinned hummingbird. Um, and so you can see how the, the numbers under Mexico are how they consider them. So they tend to rank them. The higher the number, the more at risk. Um, and it, and they, we all basically track each other. So we're all in agreement that hummingbirds are in trouble. But how we manage that and what we do is different. So how do we work? Now, I know um, a lot of people were asking, well, what, do, what does Environment for the Americas do and where are you? 
Well, we're actually based in South Boulder. So we have an office right by that funky little gas station where all those little crazy trucks are, if you've ever been there at the little El Dorado market. So whenever we want to take a break, I, funny thing for you, just as a break, I took a picture of that. Have you seen the sculpture of the buffalo out there? I took a picture of it in the snow one day and put it on my Facebook page. And somebody said, oh, you really shouldn't get so close to those buffalo. <laughs> I was like, it's fake. <laughs> so it's, that was fun. Um, but our office is right there. Um, we've looked at moving, but we have such a great view right of the foothills. And just yesterday, we had a bald eagle perched on a pole outside the office. Um, so we get great birds. We've had a kestrel hanging out there, uh, um, says Phoebes, you know, just lots of species. You'd be surprised. Um, and so we've been there for quite a while. If you ever want to stop in, please do. We'd love to see you. Our team is based across the Americas. Uh, and we have coordinators. Um, so obviously our office here, we have about uh, 13 people who come into the office here. And then we have staff based in Mexico, Central and South America, and the Caribbean. And Laura in the Caribbean is based on Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so we work with the major networks um, in those countries. For example, in Mexico, we're working with what's called the Programa de Aves Urbanas. That's their urban bird program. And in the Caribbean, we work with Birds Caribbean. So we're very we're very, we're a very collaborative organization that's um, really critical to us and to our work and to making sure that uh, we're able to be the most effective at bird conservation. Um, our other um, activities at Environment for the Americas are, as Bev mentioned, which is connecting our young people and people in general to nature and birds. And so we do that through a number of ways. We do that, that through outreach and education, um, but we also have these internship programs. And so we work with the major federal land agencies to place young and especially racially and ethnically diverse uh, young people who are interested in careers and conservation and placing them in positions uh, with partners all over the United States, as far away as Guam and the Virgin Islands. Um, this is Gabby. We sent her up um, with a special shorebird research project that we had to Cordova, where Western sandpipers come in by the, I don't know, bazillions, you know, it's just so many of them. And uh, for seven years, we did research on those birds coming through and COVID stopped that, but we just had a meeting and are looking to start that back up. It's an amazing experience. Um, most of the youth that we work with have never had a pair of binoculars. Um, we're often the ones who give them their first pair of binoculars. In fact, I was telling somebody at dinner that I ran into one of our ex-interns who's now getting his master's and has a bird research project. And he showed me his binoculars. He said, I'm still using them. So that's one of the most critical and first tools that we give our interns who are working on these projects. And the cycle goes around. So our first internship programs actually started with a National Science Foundation grant to look at how can we better engage diverse audiences in science and uh, conservation programs on public lands. And um, because of that program, we felt the strong need to be um, mentoring youth into positions where they could then become leaders at these sites. Um, and this is a picture of three of our banding interns in Ohio uh, working at Cuyahoga National Park. If you ever go to a national park, you, sh you should give me a call and I'll tell you which intern is there and we can try to set you up to meet them. But these three interns worked with one of our first um, people who helped us in the early years of Environment for the Americas. And she's Nicaraguan, came over to the United States, worked in a national park, met her husband, fell in love and never left, you know, so she's still here. And now she in turn is taking on interns from our organization, which is um, just she's a wonderful mentor. Uh, Migratory Bird Day, however, was the reason why Environment for the Americas was launched. Uh, we were, I had been working with the program, like as Bev said, since the, since it was started in the early 1990s, developing education programs for it and, and helping with the projects. Um, and then in 1999, someone called me and said, hey, we're going to we're going to shut this down. We're going to quit doing Migratory Bird Day. We just can't handle it. And I was like, no, I, I love this program. And so that's when we launched Environment for the Americas, which was to serve as the home of what was then International Migratory Bird Day. And so art has always been like 
at the heart of the organization. It, it's what informs our work every year for international, international now World Migratory Bird Day. Um, and we use it in so many different ways. Um, so this is our artist from uh, Cuba who did the poster for the year of plastic pollution. Um, he's an amazing artist. And this is our artist this year. This is Anna Rose. Anna is probably our youngest artist. She's currently in college. Uh, so she's in Ohio. So she's doing this art. <laughs> Every year it's, it's a new story about how our art comes about. But you can see the sketch. Um, these are the sketches that she would present to us before we would go to final. They have a lot of restrictions, our poor Migratory Bird Day artists. And so we we carefully control how the art is produced because, you know, it's got to go on a poster and it's got to go on materials and it can't be haphazard. And artists are amazing, but not all artists are graphic designers. So we also have a local uh, graphic designer, Karen Steenekamp, and she um, used to work for Celestial Seasonings, which tells you how, how amazing her ability is. Um, and every year she takes together these pieces and puts them together into a final piece. And it's, it's quite a bit of work. But Anna was chosen because of her skill at illustrating not only birds, but also insects. And that's our, that is our theme this year, which is um, the importance of insects to birds. And then of course, um, lastly is our own research and conservation projects protecting birds and their habitats. And we do that in many ways. Again, um, trying to incorporate our youth back into uh, research and conservation as well. So that's a little bit about Environment for the Americas. We're now, what does that make us? About 16 years old and looking forward to a good future. We have about 20 staff in total. Um, and just uh, having a good time with a lot of what we're doing, although often, you know, concerned about the birds we're working to protect. So to World Migratory Bird Day, uh, the big, the most wonderful thing about this program is the way it brings everyone together, uh, all for one reason, which is to protect birds and to learn more about birds. If you've ever... It, it, I can't see you guys on Zoom, so, you know, I don't know if you're raising your hands, but how many of you have ever been to a Migratory Bird Day event? Okay, so quite a few here. I hope the Zoomers are equally active. Uh, but we have over 700 events now um, and over 1,000 around the world. And I'll talk a little bit more about our global impact. But everybody takes the program, runs it a little bit differently, but there's always core, you know, parts to it. And all that we hope is that you accomplish these four goals, which is to, you know, help to conserve birds, raise awareness of threats to birds and conservation, um, provide education about birds and their conservation, uh, reach youth, adults, families, um, help people learn how they can protect birds at home or in their communities or, you know, in a larger area. And then always, because of our work um, across the Americas, to be reaching out to, to new communities, you know, not speaking to the choir. So making sure that we're, you know, in Colombia, we're working with indigenous communities up in the mountains. Um, we've worked with all communities across the Caribbean, um, in the United States, the same. And that's why we feel strongly about having our staff actually ref reflect our audiences um, so that we have folks who can speak to people in their own languages or, you know, understand their, their upbringing or situations. Um, our office, we speak, um, let's see, we speak Thai, there's Taiwanese, Mandarin Chinese, English, of course, French, Spanish, a little bit of Portuguese, and I think that covers it. We also want to influence decision makers. And so what we do with Migratory Bird Day is this gives you a chance to take a message and to get it out into your community. And that can be as big as you want or as small as you want. Um, just for an example, the Birds Caribbean has a huge push every year for the conservation theme that we present. They get it out in all of their information across the islands. And that's the way that they promote um, some of the actions they want to take there uh, for conservation. And so they've used that quite a, they've used it quite a bit across the islands. We also see it being very strong in many parts of the Americas. Um, in Ecuador, for example, they used our plastic pollution theme to help them uh, reduce the number of plastic bags that were used. This year, they're going to be hosting a big um, webinar and other education programs on insects. 
And of course, we have groups like in Quebec who've actually been successful at eliminating some of the most hazardous chemicals from uh, their landscaping in, in Quebec. And it can be really local. So for example, Texas is a big participant. They're a big lights out program um, participant. Uh, and also, you know, locally, like at Jackson Park, dimming the lights for migratory birds on Saturday. So even if you're working small, you know, that's a big contribution, especially as everybody comes together. And how does we how do we organize this program? So I know a lot of you were interested in this. Well, we used to do it just in the Americas, and then in 2005, somebody called up and said, hey, we really like Migratory Bird Day. We really want to do it. And we're like, great, that'd be great. And it was the Convention on Migratory Species, which is a program of the United Nations. And uh, so we talked about it, and they didn't quite come on board yet. They wanted to do their own thing. So for years, we went parallel, parallel. We could see them doing some programs and sometimes using our theme or whatever. And then finally in 2017, I got a call again from the Convention on Migratory Species and they said, hey, we want to do Migratory Bird Day with you. I said, great, we'll want to do it with you too. So in 2018, we went and met in Manila in the Philippines and we signed our first agreement uh, between the Convention on Migratory Species and the African Eurasian Water Bird Agreement that we would coordinate this program together so that we could have global impact. And so that was wonderful. And then last year, I didn't get to go to this one, but in Australia, the East Asian East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership joined this, uh, and they support the program now by coordinating activities in Asia. So we're now very global, um, covering what you can see from the map with the little borders and everything, more political boundaries rather than actual uh, biological bird migration routes. Um, but it works pretty well, even though just understand there's overlap and little sub migration areas within this very simplified migration map. And so you can see just from that, that our global event map has really started to grow um, a lot more people doing activities and events. And you'd, you'd be surprised at where they're hosted. My, one of my, my funnest activities is to take photographs of the places where I find migratory bird day in the most unusual locations. So for example, went to Nicaragua and went to, have anybody been to the island of Ometepe? Little bitty island in uh, the big lake Nicaragua. And <laughs> I went on this volcano hike where you hike up and over the volcano down to the other side. And there's this little shack hostel thing. And there on the side of the hostel is a world migra um, international migratory bird day poster. And I was like, I'm home, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's the poster. So that was great. The other thing that our international and global connections have allowed us to do is to translate everything into so many languages. I don't know if you can see that from there, but this is our Asian partners tr uh, translating it into 15 languages. <laughs> so the poster gets adapted and used. And sometimes I find it and I'm like, wow, who translated that one? I just, you know, I don't know who, who's doing it, but it's out there in just a bazillion different languages. Now, everybody wants to know when is World Migratory Bird Day? And we don't put a date on the poster. And I don't know if anybody knows why. Or does anybody know when World Migratory Bird Day is? I got May 18th. I got, what did you say, Bev? Oh, see, she knew it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's traditionally the second Saturday in May, and that's how the program was started. And when we started to grow in Latin America, it's like, why does Latin America celebrate on the second Saturday in May when there's no migratory birds there? They've already flown over. So we added another date. So we added the second Saturday in October. Um, which was good, but we we still had a problem, and I would get this like you know call places and talk to them. They say, ah, you know, Florida, our migratory birds they've already gone over. We're not we're not going to do anything this year. 
And then, and then the, the most hilarious thing was that every year on the second Saturday in May, I'd get a photo from Rocky Mountain National Park. And there they'd be standing thigh deep in snow, about six brave people holding a Migratory Bird Day poster. And finally, I went up there and said, do you guys want to move the date? And he was like, oh, yes, please. And so they did. And now they've been hosting it in June for quite a while. So we like to say that. Okay, why did that sound work? I had another thing in here. It didn't work. Um, so now we like to say every day is bird day. We encourage people to host programs and activities whenever it works for them. Uh, and so now we have events about every month of the year, all the way up into December, especially in Mexico. Um, Costa Rica really likes to host it early in the winter because there's less rain, you know, so there's all sorts of reasons, or you have a specific bird coming back or something like that. So we encourage people to do that. So this year, uh, our theme is insects uh, and, and their importance to birds. And this has been a theme. This is one of the funnest parts of Migratory Bird Day. And so if you ever want to get involved, just please do, uh, is we make this a public vote. So everybody gets a say on what our conservation theme is going to be. Now, obviously, our global flyway partners, Convention on Migratory Species, and, and all those groups are going to make a kind of a final call on it, and it might depend on something more political. But um, we do keep the top voted themes on, on tap. Uh, so the insect theme has been waiting for a couple years, actually, and everybody's really excited that it's going to happen this year. It's the first time we've ever presented other organisms on the internet or on the World Migratory Bird Day materials. So that's also fun. But it's also a great opportunity to bring um, a new aspect of bird conservation to your public. And you know, a lot of people don't think of insects and how many birds they support. Um, you know, it's it's easy to think of like the night hawk on the left, and this is a South American night hawk. This is one of our focal species this year, and we always throw in a South American species for our partners down there. So this is what's known as an austral migrant, and it's actually not super migratory, but um, it does move between uh, countries in South America, which totally depends on insects because it's, it is an insectivorous bird. But a lot of people don't think about shorebirds as being insect eaters, where where they do actually depend on a lot of insects for their di diet, especially in spring when they're migrating north. So this is a bird that's probing and feeding on larvae in the sand, and it needs those insects, especially for fuel as it's moving uh, far north um, for to migrate and then migrate and then breed. So these are all the pieces that Anna put together. Now, some artists for us will work on the whole piece, um, but I would say that most artists are maybe individual species illustrators, like I said, not graphic designers. Um, so she does a great job on the design, but Karen, we do depend on her to put this together. Every bird that goes on a poster, if you ever look at a poster, every bird was selected for a reason, at least since 2000. Before then, not so much. Um, but every species was selected first to make our birders happy. So we have a duck, a hummingbird, a raptor, a shorebird, a passerin, you know, a swallow. So we have something that represents everything everybody works on because, boy, if you don't have it on there, they're like, eh, nah, not this year. So we just make sure. And, you know, um, every insect came from a scientific report. So everyone that we chose here, I should have made this a quiz for you, Pam, and not put the species on there. So every species was chosen because we went to the scientific literature or we called an expert and we read about which insect they feed on. So for example, for the um, for the broad-tailed hummingbird there, we called David Inouye at Crested Butte. He's a really well-known hummingbird researcher, been studying hummingbirds for years, broad-tailed is his specialty. And he was like, yeah, they go out over the ponds and they feed on those emerging insects. They just fly out back and forth, back and forth feeding on them. Um, so uh, so that's where we got the insects. So everything is scientifically accurate. We had it reviewed. If you know Rebecca Saffron from University of Colorado, she works on um, barn swallows. So she reviewed our text to make sure our swallow information is correct. Um, for our pesticides work, we have a 
pesticide person from American Bird Conservancy. For our insects, we have somebody from the Xerxes Society. So we have everybody, we get a, we also get a scientific and outside review as well. So when you think about this over the years, you know, people always ask me, well, you know, once you have Migratory Bird Day, what do you do the rest of the year? I'm like, oh my gosh, this program, if you've ever put on an event, it takes so long. So right now we're going into the period where we're going to choose the theme for 2025. That's supposed to happen in April. And then we'll put it out to vote in April, May to make a final decision by June so that hopefully we can get an artist in time to get the art done in time. So it's, a, it's quite the process at the same time that we're finishing up, you know, 2024 events. So the art, again, is at the heart of our organization. And um, all of our programs have launched from Migratory Bird Day. Now, back in 1998, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, um, up until 2000, we, 2000 was our first poster. Um, and that's a poster that was donated by the estate of Roger Tory Peterson. And um, I actually designed it <laughs> on a very ancient form of InDesign. Um, so it's probably one of our crudest posters. Um, but the Fish and Wildlife Service asked us to choose that one and to do the focus on the falcon theme um, to celebrate the recovery of, of peregrine, peregrine falcons. Um, so that was the year they were taken off. Uh, the endangered species list. And what you'll notice, so in 2001, there's a story behind every one of these posters. We traveled to Guatemala and took the artist down there so he could firsthand see a shade coffee plantation. And we went to Starbucks and asked them if they would please carry shade coffee and they declined. Um, and then in 2002, we worked with Charlie Harper, if you know him, an amazing man, and he donated um, his art to the program. Gerald Sneed in 2003, Ron Papish did seabirds, and he's, if you ever meet him, he paints his clothes, so he puts seabirds on his pants, you know, they're amazing. And then tragedy hit in 2005 when we had the best, one of the best artists ever, and we just blew it um, on the collisions poster, which was uh, when we got so many comments. So David Sibley illustrated 2005, and unfortunately, people did not like the way it looked like birds were running into the glass and nobody wanted this poster. And the comments we got were, we want to hear about the conservation theme and the issues, but we want the poster to be pretty. That was the last year we did that. So Colorado artist, um, oh my gosh, it just went out of my head. Uh, anyways, from Southern Colorado, uh, did the 2006 and um, Louise Zemitis from Cape May, 2007. And then I wanna bring back in the hummingbird because you know it's notable that we never had hummingbirds for the first uh, major period of Migratory Bird Day. And again, because hummingbirds are just left out of the bird research and conservation uh, conversation. Um, there are, there have, hadn't been bird hummingbird groups you know, there are shorebird groups, there are raptor conservation groups, there are all sorts of groups, but no hummingbirds. And so it wasn't until we worked with Andy Everson, who's a First Nations Native American artist up in um, British Columbia, uh, that when we talked about how we wanted this birds and culture piece to work, that he started talking about the mythology and the, le you know, the legends behind the hummingbird. Um, this was the first year that we also had digital art and I didn't even realize it. So one of our deals is, is that when the artist does the art, we get the original. So I call Andy up and I said, hey, Andy, okay, you can send me the art. He goes, I can send you the art. It's on my computer. I was like, I had no idea you could do that on a computer. Um, but, you know, they can. Um, Bob Petty, formerly working at uh, National Audubon Society in their education department. Again, we had Rufus Hummingbird on this species to celebrate the power of partnerships. And then again, when we did this piece with a little hummingbird sitting on the heron beak. Um, our two, uh, I'll have to go back and tell you this one, 2012. If you recognize this artist, he's done a number of postage stamps and incredible artist from Mexico. And I called him up for the art and he said, my wife took it. So his wife has it. I never got that piece. Um, 
So over the years, we've talked about a, a number of topics from why birds matter, restoring habitat, the importance of stopover sites. Um, and then we've looked at the plastic pollution. Um, also, birds connect our culture, which was a wonderful one during COVID. Um, dim, uh, our dim the lights for birds at night was a wonderful way to present uh, the, the idea that our night skies and our skies in general are a habitat um, and very critical to birds. And that theme comes up again this year as we think about insects and where many insects are, which is you know in the air where birds are foraging on them. Um, and then our World Migratory Bird Day on Water last year was also su extremely successful. Um, so, so what about birds and insects? And you know, this topic is, again, one that a lot of people don't think too much about because in general, I think we have a somewhat negative impression of insects, um, but they are everywhere. They're on our shorelines, they're in our wetlands. And if you think about, you know, for example, let's go back to the duck. You know, not many people think about ducks as feeding on insects, but they do on the surface of the water and even below the surface. Um, obviously in grasslands with our raptors and with aerial insectivores. Um, bobolinks depend on insects and they tend to forage for them on the ground. They walk on the ground feeding on um, small insects and larvae. But at the same time, we have a, a large problem happening in parallel, which is that our insectivorous birds are declining and it is in part, at least for some species, likely because the insects they depend on are also declining. Now to get back to our hummingbird, most people don't think of hummingbirds as insect eaters, but in fact, they probably depend on insects for at least 20% of their diet. And that's not only for the adults, but it's also very much something that their chicks depend on and what the adults are feeding their chicks so that they can fledge. And so where are hummingbirds having problems with insects? And so what is, what is affecting both of them and how does this move through the food chain? Um, and it's just in so many different ways. Um, so when you think about this crop here, this is a growing crop in Mexico. Um, it's expanded rapidly. And you might be able to guess what this crop is. Yes, avocados. Um, so these are avocados. The avocado industry has uh, just burgeoned in the, in the in recent years and taken over lots of land. It's even become somewhat of a criminal activity from what our partners say where the um, avocado farmers come in and kind of force the local farmers or residents out for their crops, but it takes up so much habitat. Um, the Western Hummingbird Partnership is actually supporting a research project right now, and that um, uh, university professor and her students are studying uh, the impacts of avocado, uh, the ad avocado cult, you know, crops on hummingbird populations. And then even in Canada, um, where the big blueberry fields are. So one of our committee members is a scientist with Environment and Climate Change Canada. And um, she's been researching the use of pesticides on this crop for a number of years. And then the, the impacts of that, ins those insecticides on hummingbirds. So what are the threats to hummingbirds? And you've probably all heard of the neonics, but there's a, just a suite of other chemicals um, out there that are sprayed on our crops and that are used, you know, in many different ways. So a lot of them are, are used to treat seeds um, and then some are sprayed. And what they're finding is that even when hummingbirds, even if they're not feeding directly on the crop, that spray is going out, uh, you know, outside of the crop, it gets blown around. Um, and so it even affects, say, the flowering plants that are around the crops. And that's where the hummingbirds are likely picking it up. Um, and so that's uh, the way they do this is they take some of the hummingbirds and they take feathers or they take fecal samples and they study those to see which chemicals are in their bodies. And so again, it's not just hummingbirds, but it's other species like our swallows and even our sparrows and um, blackbirds who are picking up all of these pesticides. These chemicals get into the water system, they get into the soil, um, and they just really spread throughout the environment. Um, the results of her study showed that, um, which she did from 2015 to 2018, um, that they did, they worked at 39 sites, and that most of these sprays were near blueberry fields in the Fraser Valley of BC, where we get a lot of our blueberries. 
So when you buy your blueberries, think about this. Um, this is these toxins are intense. They're systemic, especially the neonics. Uh, they're applied and then they spread throughout the entire plant. Um, they're persistent. They last a long time and they're neurotoxins. Um, so their effects on birds are many, um, although it's difficult to study it unless you can have birds in the lab. Um, but it can, you know, it affects um, their behavior, affects their ability to fly, um, and just to accomplish their daily activities in the way that they normally would. And, you know, you think about the messaging. So even when we're looking for materials for this theme this year, and you think about the messaging about insects, a lot of what we find is insects kill it, right? It, it reminds me of when I was at home visiting my mother one day, and I heard the neighbors out there, and they had this little girl, and she's putting up a fuss, and I hear the mother out there, don't worry, it's just a bug. And then she said, squish it. And I thought, what? why? <laughs> why do you need to squish it? Um, but that's our idea about insects and bugs is that we need to get rid of them. We need to clean them up. Um, so this use of even common household chemicals is quite common. And you think about this is this is the old raid I knew as a kid, you know, um, but it lasts a long time. When I was reading up on raid, it works for four weeks. And um, again, it's it affects the nervous system. Um, so you're spraying this around your house and you're killing insects, but then, you know, you think about that at the small local household level and take that up, um, for birds when it's sprayed more broadly and you get all of these kinds of impacts, they, uh, suppressed respiration and ruby throated hummingbirds. Um, it can be lethal, reduced ap appetite, body mass affecting, uh, the physiology, delaying migration. Um, other effects on organ function, hormone regulation, and so forth and so on. So it's just a litany of impacts that it can have. And you imagine a hummingbird, which is so small, um, you know, it, it's not hard to impact a hummingbird. So what are we doing? Um, we've been working again with our partners. Um, we're developing the first hummingbird conservation plan, uh, starting with the, with the theme of agriculture. So we've put together working across borders. And it's more interesting than you think. When we went through the conservation plan, you know, everything was um, representatives from Canada, United States, and Mexico, um, biologists, land managers, uh, conservationists, um, discussing what the issues are at the different phases of a hummingbird's life cycle. So what are the issues on the non-breeding grounds? What are the issues in the United States? Uh, what are the issues as they migrate, uh, Rufus hummingbird migrating through the U.S.? And then what are the issues on the um, breeding grounds? And coming up with different strategies along the way, uh, looking at agriculture, collisions, um, climate change. What else do we have? Um, and then we have other things in there like... Um, you know, if you don't know that uh, hummingbirds are considered like aphrodisiacs in Mexico, so they actually carry dead hummingbirds in their pocket, um, or they take them and make some sort of, I don't know, hummingbird potion, you know, that they use there. So, you know, different things happening at different places that are, you know, also difficult and hard on hummingbirds. The hummingbirds aren't the only one. This video won't play, so um, apologies for that, but this is a kestrel. And, you know, if you think about a kestrel, it also depends on um, insects. And one of its main food sources is grasshoppers. So that's a big part of its diet. Kestrels um, have been declining, as has its main, one of its favorite insects, the grasshopper. And throwing in here Anna's art versus a real image of this red-legged grasshopper, which is one of the preferred species. So Anna's art on the top and then the real grasshopper on the bottom. Um, but then you can see that grasshoppers are in the pink. And just like our birds, you know, we're starting to have this kind of, uh, you know, nearly half the species in rapid decline. Um, so grasshoppers are in rapid decline. And what does that mean? So as these grasshoppers are declining, um, kestrel populations are also declining. Uh, and that's across the United States. Although apparently it's maybe more extreme in the east than in the west. Um, but you can see from the map also where the extreme declines are, uh, where we don't have much knowledge, which is the orange. And then the little green areas are where kestrel populations are increasing. So not too many places where they're increasing. 
So what are some things that we can do? One thing that we learn from a migratory bird day event is that most people who come are not, they're not knowledgeable birders and that's good. That's who we want. We're, we're your introduction. Um, if you wanna use binoculars for the first time, um, meet a biologist or an ornithologist, take a bird walk, um, not feel like you have to know the birds or anything. Um, and then have some fun activities and eat, then Migratory Bird Day is typically a good place for you. Now, there are more extreme Migratory Bird Day activities like 24-hour birdathons and, you know, um, hot birder walks and, and activities like that, but not all of them. Um, so what we try to do, and May 18th is at Walden Ponds. We hope you'll join us there. Migratory Bird Day, we have, I think, 13 organizations coming out, bird walks all day, uh, lots of things going on. Um, just simple activities at home, leaving the leaves. You know, we like to have clean yards uh, and everybody does yard cleanup, but those leaves or other cover are so important as shelter and a source of protection for insects. So leaving that out. Um, some gardeners say, you know, at least don't clean up your yard until it's 50 degrees um, steadily um, outside. And then of course, plant native. I know you all know that, but this time it takes a different twist, which is fun. Um, so not only planting native for birds, but planting native for insects. So we need our insects to have their plants so that then our birds can have their insects. Um, so it's a little bit of a different look at it, which I really love that. And then reducing chemical use, of course. And I think that we're all struggling uh, with trying to change the ideas about what a lawn should look like. And, um, you know, being able to embrace a wilder lawn and considering what it takes to have the more manicured lawn, the amount of chemicals and time and grooming um, that then gets into our soils and waters with the amount of chemicals you have to use to do that. And we're brought back to our previous theme, which is dim the lights for birds at night. But this time we get to throw in insects because they respond in much the same way as birds. That is, they're attracted to light, as you know, and they can have the same response in terms of circling around the light, becoming more vulnerable to birds, um, being exhausted by the circling, and then you know ultimately dying from that. Uh, so turning out your lights at night is the best option. And if if that doesn't work, then at least shielding them so they don't the glow doesn't expand out um, uh, out and up, or um, or using different light bulbs or dark sky lighting is beneficial. Something a lot of people don't think about is where you get your garden plants. And these plants, a lot of the, especially the big box stores, they're gonna use chemicals on them. And so if you were to go to your plant shop and say, hey, do you have information about how these plants were treated? Uh, a lot of them are gonna tell you they're using neonics. Um, so my friend's a gardener up in Summit County and she's got a garden there. And she said, I just wrote every one of my, every one of my um, suppliers and I asked him, hey, what kind of chemicals are you using on your on your plants? And she said two of her favorite suppliers are using neonics. Um, so, you know, go to those garden shops where they're not going to do that because this is going to stay in the system. And these are these are flowers that hummingbirds are going to feed on. And then, of course, changing perceptions, um, how we think about insects. And it's easy with a butterfly, but maybe not so easy with, you know, a cockroach. I don't know. So where are we going from here? Well, we're super busy at Environment for the Americas. And um, one of the exciting things that I'll share is that we've just launched um, a research project with uh, the University of California, Riverside. So we're gonna be working with a hummingbird researcher there and his um, doctoral student, Mary. And our friends at Cellular Technologies have created a tag that is light enough in weight to put on a hummingbird. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> so we're, everybody's super excited and we're trying to hold back because what we want to know is, is the tag itself going to hurt the hummingbird? So if everybody goes out and starts willy nilly putting these tags on hummingbirds, are we going to be killing hummingbirds? Um, so there was a brief launch in Mexico with one of our partners. She put a tag on some local resident species and put them in a cage and watched them to see if the you know, how are we going to put these on? And we're using a little harness um, that goes around and under the wing for right now. And this little tag weighs about 0 0.06 grams. Uh, it has to be at least 3% or less of the body mass of the bird. And we have to take into consideration a lot of different things like 
um, when the bird migrates and it loses weight, what's going to happen to this harness? Is it going to loosen up and then it's going to entangle the bird or what will happen? So we don't want to put one on a rufous hummingbird, you know, that's trying to make its journey and cause it to fail. So starting in April, we'll uh, UC Riverside has a big aviary. They'll be putting them on captive birds and watching them fly, watching them move, seeing if it affects, you know, extreme behaviors like courtship dives, um, if when preening their beak gets caught, you know, just all sorts of things. They have a wind tunnel. Um, so we're really excited to be testing this out. Um, looking forward to see what we can figure out. And then, oh, we're hoping they work so that we can learn more about these little birds. Um, the Bird City Network, uh, we are partners with the American Bird Conservancy on developing this program. In fact, the way we learned about it was because it started in Wisconsin. And when I was looking at Migratory Bird Day events, I was like, wow, Wisconsin has a lot of events. They've got like 40. And the next year I went and looked and they had 60. And then it, next year I was like 80. And I called Wisconsin and I said, do you know what's going on and why there are so many Migratory Bird Day events in Wisconsin? And they said, oh, yeah, we've got the Bird City program, and Migratory Bird Day is a required part of that. So we're like, great. So um, a couple of years ago, um, American Bird Conservancy hired the person out of Wisconsin um, to make the program national. We since have adopted it in Colorado and are starting slowly. Superior has an application in. Peter, if you're out there, we're going to get to it. And um, uh, we're also in charge of launching it in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we did our first uh, our first bird cities in Colombia and Mexico. So if you go to Cozumel to have a beach vacation, um, please visit some of our partners there who are in charge of Bird City Cozumel. And then in Colombia, they did an amazing job. Uh, we went to Colombia to celebrate with them um, last spring. Um, other programs we hope you'll join us with is Bird Book Club. Uh, we have a, every one Thursday of the month, we bring in an author and uh, they introduce their book, answer questions, talk about it. This year, we're bringing in a, an insect person, the person who wrote Alien Worlds. And um, I, what I'm really excited about, I have to say, is Amy Tan, uh, the author of The Joy Luck Club. Um, so she'll be coming on with a book of hers later. Um, we got Christian Cooper, who's... Um, You've probably heard of him. He talks about, you know, uh, being a di diverse person in birding. So super excited about that as well. I know I'm coming to the end here. And so I want to end with a Keshwa tale for you. And I love this story. It's a very simple but sweet story and just kind of makes you think. And I, it gets overwhelming, you know, trying to protect birds. It feels like ever since Bev and I started it, there's more and more, there are more and more threats, you know, than what we used to work with. And I, I think oh, I just like to go back to the days of we were worried about McDonald's burgers being cattle from Argentina or, you know, habitat fragmentation. It's, it's gotten much more complex. And so the story of the fire is kind of like that. It's like there's this huge, big, hot fire and all the animals are looking at it thinking, um, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, what are we going to do? So the bear comes out and he's like, oh. I can't put this fire out. This is too big for me. I'm a big animal, but this is huge. This is a huge fire. I'm not going to do anything about it. And the squirrel runs out and says, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can't do anything. I'm too little. I'm too little. I can't help with this fire. And, you know, then the, the wolf comes out and says, oh, I'm a wise thing, but, you know, what can I do with this fire? It's already gotten too large and it's spreading so fast. I can't I can't help it. There's only so much I can do. And of course, the little rabbit comes hopping in and is like, not me. I am definitely not going to be hopping into that hot fire. And so they look up and they see this hummingbird and it's coming back and forth. It's coming back and forth with a drop of water. And I'm like, what do you think you're doing? Uh, you're not going to be able to help. What are you going to do one drop at a time? How are you going to put that fire out? And the little hummingbird is like, you know, you got to do what you can. And this is what I'm going to do. So I invite you all to join the little hummingbird in this beautiful tale from the Keshwa and do whatever you can. It all counts. And the more each of us does, the more that adds up around the world to protect migratory birds. So thank you very much for having me tonight. I really appreciate it. And um, 
Look forward to working with you in the future. I think that's got it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. That was amazing. Uh, I wanted to mention two things and then I'll take questions. One is that Boulder County Audubon is one of the partners participating in the Walden Ponds yeah, World Mike Day. Thank you. So we're, we're doing that again this year. And then also, I think there was a colorful poster showing behind me and on Zoom when I was talking at first. That was, I'm pretty sure, and Sue found the image today and sent it to me, the very first International Migratory Bird Day poster from 1993. I think I have one at home rolled up in a tube somewhere. Anyway, um, so we'll take questions. Uh, Sandra, are there any on Zoom to start with? And then we'll go to the room. Sure, we do. Lillian, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, um, I was just wondering how you're funded. How are you funded, Sue? We beg every day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're we're um, a mix, but we're interestingly very heavily federally funded. Um, we receive funds from the U.S. Forest Service international programs, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, the National Park Service. Um, so a lot of our funding for our internship programs, the Western Hummingbird Partnership, even Migratory Bird Day, come from those come from those funders. And a lot of people probably don't know the broad range of work that the Forest Service does, but they do their international programs department is is really phenomenal. Um, and so they do pull together a lot of partnerships across uh, around the world. Uh, it's pretty fascinating. Are you partly funded by donations? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We like donations. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> memberships. We've, we're, we're, we're pretty young, um, but um, we do take memberships, donations. We do write proposals. So we've uh, gotten National Science Foundation grants, other small grants. Um, we get National Park Foundation funding. So, you know, a variety of different uh, sources. Okay. Any questions in the room and wait for me to bring the microphone to you so that the Zoomers can hear you. Um, Susan, you um, mentioned early on how difficult it was to um, assess population status for hummingbirds. So this is a two-part question. How confident are you with the 50% decline and what by what parameters have you measured it? And number two, um, the Anna's is doing well, and you mentioned by expanding its range. And I was fascinated by the map of where the roofy demons, there's a new one for you, <laughs> have been sighted all over America. Uh, might this be the salvation? That's a good question. Um, so the the declines were were informed by the breeding bird survey. Um, and so that's a well peer reviewed paper, um, by again, our partner in Canada. Um, again, you know, I, I still do think it's kind of hard because on a breeding bird survey, especially in a place where you get species that aren't noisy, you know, um, I don't know how you capture them so well, but it's long-term data. So, you know, you're looking at data from from the 70s. So that's a lot of data. So when you have that much data over that much time, you know, it's pretty meaningful. So even if even if the total numbers were maybe lower because you can't detect them much, the decline is significant, right? So that's meaningful. So even if we don't know how many, it's like, um, you know, we're seeing it with common birds. I mean, Partners in Flight used to have the saying, you know, what we're about is keeping common birds common. Well, now some of those birds, like if you look at the 3 billion birds, some of those are very common birds. It's blackbirds, you know, that have declined so much. Um, so I think having, I feel confident about her work because I think it's the detection of the decline that's what we're concerned about. 
Zoomer questions? Janet, would you like to unmute and ask your question? I actually found it on the website. So I did go to the website and found what I was looking for with regards to the book club. So. Oh, I thought it was the donation button. <laughs> <laughs> but but maybe maybe that was the, nice people, <laughs> the question was about information on the book club and how to sign up so maybe the people in the room would like that who can't go to the website right now yeah oh. sure. yeah you can go to environment for the americas and go to our programs or education tab and you'll see bird book club thank you hold on let me let me get the microphone over to you Is the book club in person or is it virtual? It's virtual. Okay. So it, it's something we started during COVID. We actually started a virtual bird camp for kids and we actually started the book reading um, for children. So we had story time once a week and it was really fun. And then one of the staff had the idea of doing it for adults. So it's been really good. Other questions in the room? Right. Okay, we've got two, so I'll go to Carol first, George. I'll get you in a minute. Audubon has a, um, t a teen naturalist program. And is there any way that they could be connect, or have you worked with any of them? They could be talking about education and with teenagers that they could uh, do some sort of internship or? Oh, yeah. Now our yeah, our internships are for a little bit older, um, so they're kind of early career. Um, so we're taking interns at, sometimes we'll take a freshman in college, but usually we're looking at at least juniors. Um, you know, I can't speak enough about the importance of those. And again, we're working with some students who haven't had a lot of the opportunities that a lot of people have had. So they haven't gotten to volunteer at nature centers or go be at bird banding stations. Um, like, like I mentioned, often when we give them a pair of binoculars, it's their first pair of binoculars. They've never had binoculars. So when we started our shorebird team, um, we would do a week long training in San Diego with our interns. They got their first pair of binoculars. They learned how to use a spotting scope. And we would teach them how to identify shorebirds and conduct shorebird surveys. Well, you know how hard shorebirds are. They're hard, <laughs> but they did such an amazing job. And I think, you know, what we saw was that then uh, in those cohorts, they really bonded. And one year, our team took themselves down to um, a shorebird meeting, and they were the only First of all, they were the only young biologists of color at the meeting. So um, that was one thing. And then, uh, you know, it was all our interns. So it was just kind of spectacular. And so it was just, it's just been really fun to see how successful those kinds of programs can be. We're just really excited by what it does for a career. You know. Do we have more Zoom questions? We do. Jessica, would you like to unmute and ask your question? And, and your question uh, connects to who you are. So tell us that too. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jessica Miller. I'm the education coordinator for the Rocky Mountain Raptor program up in Fort Collins. And we're holding an open house on Migratory Bird Day. And I wanted to know how we could get that event on if you have like a listing or promotions or anything like that to be part of the celebration. Absolutely. You are a bird city. So, you know, you should be doing that. Um, yeah, just get in. I can um, put you on. If you go to our website, you can go find, uh, you can either go to environmentamericas.org and go to Migratory Bird Day, and it'll take you to the global map um, and everything that you need. Um, you can call us and if you, you know, want to get any education materials, let us know. Um, we can work with you on that. And then we can we're also launching an app this year, so you can put your information up on the app. I'm ju we're just getting it up on the web, but it'll be up there. You can add the name of your organization, a picture of you or whoever, uh, information about the event. Um, so there are many different ways we can do that. And then we're advertising the local Colorado ones on our calendar. So if you want us to put it on our calendar, we're happy to promote your event also in Colorado. Okay, we have another question from the room. So you mentioned the uh, blueberry fields in Fraser Valley. 
and I guess I didn't realize they were sprayed. How important is it that we encourage organic blueberries? Uh, well, <laughs> organic everything. Yeah. I, I mean, there there's challenges with organic too, because just because they're organic doesn't mean they don't get some form of chemical, you know, um, they, they, they do get stuff. I, I personally quit eating blueberries. I just, I think about all those chemicals going on them. And then I read the research on the hummingbirds. And there's also a woman out of UC Davis working on this, working on pesticides as well. And it's, to me, it's, it's scary. I just, um, I, I don't, I won't eat them. Um, and, you know, you can find lists of foods that are more dangerous in terms of pesticides, like the ones that are really absorbing a lot of the pesticides. Um, so a lot of the berries, obviously, if they get sprayed, you know, they're just going to have more chemicals in them. <laughs> um, and I don't know if, you know, washing them off helps. I just, I just don't know. So, yeah. Well, and when you think about it, if it's a neonic, like they said, it's a systemic. So it's something that gets up into the plants. It's not just, you know, it's everywhere. It's in the soil. It's in the plants. It's in the water. Um, so I guess, you, you know, you have to make your decisions about what you can give up. And my husband is incredibly distressed about my unwillingness to buy berries. And uh, and the other reason why I won't buy them is because they come in those plastic cartons. So, <laughs> so I've, I've pretty much given up berries. Yeah. Any, hang on, Paula. The two hummingbird banders that we have in, in the front range, um, Steve Baricious and Scott Rashid. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do you know if they've noticed whether hummingbirds in the front range or the ones that they banned have been de decreasing? You know, I was just in Sedona with them last year because we were all at the Sedona Hummingbird Festival. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't hear them talk about that. And and one thing it would take is that long-term data analysis for them to, I don't know if they've looked at their data that way. Like, I mean, they probably notice I got fewer birds this year. Or I got more last year. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think everybody's seeing fewer humm hummingbirds. Um, well, they have really have systematic data. I know Steve does. Yeah, yeah Steve does. So does Scott. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure I, don't, I don't know. I haven't talked to him about that. Do we have more Zoom questions? I it's also very local, you know, their work. Yeah. And then to, to Pam's question about is the range or what looks like an expanding range of Rufus, you know, going to save them? I don't know. And I hope so. Um, and what I, what I hope is that we get more information about them too. Like how many are there in those locations? <laughs> we just don't know. You know, there's the occasional one sighting. I got a Rufus hummingbird. But again, there aren't that many banders, you know, even in the east. There's, you know, there's Bill Hilton and the Carolinas, and there's some banding going on in Alabama. Um, and then, you know, odd places like some state parks in Arkansas uh, where they banned hummingbirds, which I was surprised by. So spotty. It's not like, you know, the other banding stations. And I want to add something else to, about the, the success of our internship programs. One of our interns, we did a two-year study on the Angeles National Forest looking at the impacts of fire, and that came back to hummingbirds also and what hummingbirds need after fire. Um, but one of our interns and techs, two of them actually, um, have you ever birded in chaparral? When we went to the Angeles National Forest, I thought, oh, this is going to be so horrible birding. You know, it's the shrubby, dry stuff, you know, and I was like, ugh. And, and then the Angeles National Forest, the other thing about it, it's the steepest national forest in the country. So I thought, we're going to do bird count surveys, and we're going to run our transect, and we're going to take off like we do in Colorado. Well, you can't do that because the soil gives way. You go sliding forever. So the only thing we could do was take advantage of roads. It was the most amazing birding I've ever seen. The birds were coming through there on migration, like, you know, whizzing by us. I was just amazed. It was incredible. And two of the interns got really jazzed about it. And they've started their own monitoring station up there. So incredible work. So they have this bear divide um, bird banding station up in the Angeles National Forest. So it's, it's, it's an amazing job that they did. And they... Um, they're on their third year, I think. 
Any more Zoom questions? I don't see any more. Anybody else in the room? One more. Do you work with, I, I'm thinking of the Swainson's Hawks um, going down to Argentina, is that right? And uh -huh. and such good grasshopper mm -hmm. uh, eaters, predators. Mm -hmm. And have you been working with people there? I know they're, they spray. Yeah, so that was a long ago issue. And the reason why I know how long ago it was, was that we used that as one of our focal species one year. And when we did the education packet, what we created was a series of overhead images you know those overhead what were those things those big machines you know oh overhead projectors yeah an overhead yeah. projector yeah a big overhead projector so we had this whole series of overhead projector i mean i still have some um and one of them was the swainson's hawk because of that spraying issue i can't remember what year that was it was in the 1990s remember and so we had a envelope packet you could pull out your your 10 little plastic sheets with the image and put it on the <laughs> overhead projector. Um, they actually worked with Argentina. And my understanding was that they actually kind of mitigated that problem. Um, so that was a success story, you know, because they did, they found thousands of Swainson's hawk dead down there because of the spraying and the impact on insects. All right. It's probably time to wind this up. I want to thank Sandra, our Zoom maven, and Michael in the back for making this hybrid format work seamlessly. Yay. And thank you, Sue. Thanks thank again you. for a great talk. Yeah, thanks, everybody.